Hello, my name is Dr. Jeff Kettle. I'm from the School of Electronic Engineering at Bangor University. And the topic of my talk is application of flexible OPVs for, for building integrated applications. So just a, a very brief overview of the technology. Um, OPVs have a number of advantages over other technologies for building integrated applications. Um, firstly, when we, when we consider the, 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 the production processes, First of all, we do a lot of the processing at very low temperatures. Um, we don't have very many rare materials within the production process, and the, the energy, energy payback time of an OPV can be very low. Um, some reports say it suggest much less than, than one month. So the modules themselves tend to be lightweight and flexible. Um, however, there are a couple of disadvantages. One of the first is the, the efficiency is much lower than silicon. So the, 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 the maximum lab-based efficiency is around about 13%, and they also exhibit relatively poor lifetimes. So in terms of organic solar cells for building integrated applications, um, there's been a number of demonstrators already, already reported, um, a lot of them by Heliotech in Dresden. So Heliotech have, have got an array of demonstrators where they've, they've laminated or, or integrated solar cells directly into windows or, or other building products. And there's been other examples such as, as bus shelters which, which have organic solar cells also laminated onto them. And in addition there's, there's, there's people like uh, Infinity PV here, in, here in, in, in Denmark who've developed sort of electronic bike chargers. So silicon ha has been widely used for building integrated applications but it does have a few drawbacks. T typically a, a silicon based building integrated PV module is around about 60% more expensive than a conventional module and it also has longer longer installation times. So we've been working on a, a project called Steel PV. Um, steel PV, what we're aiming to do is functionalise low-cost industrial steels for integration into to fin film PV devices. So I suppose the innovation is we, we're going to look towards newer steel substrates or particularly sort of lower cost steel substrates and, and functionalise them in some way where, whereby they can be integrated into uh, PV products. So there's a number of sectors this, this, this could be interesting for. Uh, first of all is building integrated PVs, but then secondly we can start thinking about using PVs in, in, in automotive applications or for uh, road infrastructures. So we've, in collaboration, well, in collaboration with um, a private research centre in Spain, we, we've, look, we've identified four main steels to use. Um, so these range from stainless steel through to a, a low carbon steel and also some galvanised products as well. So these, these different steel grades have different uh, prices. Uh, low carbon steel is a very, very cheap form of steel and stainless steel is a, is a slightly more expensive type of steel. Now with all of these steels what we tend to do is, is roll the steel so we use a, a low cost rolling uh, process which allows us to first of all decrease the roughness of the steel but also reduce the thinness so we can we can use steel sheets for, for production of solar cells. What, what we've identified is um, an optimum thickness so if we, can, if we can take the thickness down to around about 0.3 millimetres then the cost of that steel substrate assuming that the solar cell gives around about 10% efficiency, um, can be less than 0.1 uh, euros per watt. However, the, the steel still needs to um, have a number of additional properties um, in order to make it compatible with, with solar cell technologies. So first of all, the, the quality of the steel surface isn't quite sufficiently high. Um, so what we need to do is deposit something known as an intermediate layer. So the intermediate layer is a, is a coating which is applied onto the top of the steel and what it does it reduces the surface roughness of our steel substrates and that makes it compatible for thin film solar cell deposition and also monolithic connection in a, in a series connected cell. But that intermediate layer also needs to avoid uh, diffusion of, of elements from the, the steel substrate into our solar cell and it also needs to act as a, a good dielectric barrier so we can't have any, any, any voltage shorts between our steel substrate and our, and our solar cell. So in Bangor we've, we've developed a process where we apply a, uh, an, an epoxy based coating onto steel. 
So typically the steel, steel substrates have a, a relatively high initial surface roughness. Maybe the RA of this, these substrates are about 0.5 microns and R max can be anything from between 1 and 5 microns. Which is a problem for... <laughs> you cut this bit out, yeah? Yeah, we'll be cut out. Okay. Let's, let's wait until it's ready. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So the OPV active layer is typically from about 70 to 500 nanometers thick. Um, so if we try using an OPV active layer directly on a steel substrate, then we're almost certainly going to get electrical shorts. So therefore we apply this, this, this epoxy planarization layer onto our steel substrate. And what we're able to do is dramatically reduce the roughness, um, and we reduce the roughness to less than 10 nanometers. So it's almost like a, it's almost a glass-like finish on, onto our steel. And in addition, this, this uh, epoxy-based coating acts as a very good dielectric, um, so we get very little leakage current through from our solar cell into, into the steel substrate. So there's a second major challenge about uh, developing organic solar cells onto, onto steel substrates, and that's finding a good electrode. So typically what we do is um, spray coat on um, a composite electrode, which consists of P-dot and silver nanowires. So P-dot on its own, we, we, we tend to mix with a, a high boiling point solvent, such as DMSO. And unfortunately, we can't get the sheet resistance of these layers down to an acceptable value um, whilst maintaining a good, good transparency. So what we tend to do is, is spray coat on a silver nanowire, so it becomes a, a composite electrode as well. Typically, the sort of performances we get with this are, are quite um, are very, very good. Um, so the best performance we've achieved with a, a silver nanowire electrode onto an organic solar cell uh, active layer is around about 15 ohms square with, with a transmittance of 90%. So this is the, the configuration we use for manufacturing an organic solar cell onto an opaque substrate. So we start off with our, our steel substrate, we then apply on a, a planarization layer, an intermediate layer, which consists of SU8. Then on top of that, we, we deposit our back electrode, and that back electrode could be silver or it could be aluminium. We then apply our um, electron transporting layer, which is zinc oxide, our active layer, and then finally the, the composite top electrode. So light, light comes into the solar cell through, through the silver nanowire electrode, and then it's, it's, it's um, absorbed by the P3HT PCBM active layer. So shown here is a, is a cross-section of the, the, the device, and you can see the, the various layers, including the, the cathode and active layer and P-dot, and you can see the, the nanowires on, on the surface of the device. So in terms of the sort of performances we get from this configuration, it's, it's around about 2.6% 2. 2. efficiency. Um, so that's done over a relatively large active area, around one centimeter squared. Um, it's slightly lower than the sort of performances we get onto the glass substrates. So on glass, we get around about 3%, but it's slightly higher than the sort of performances we get on a, a PET substrate, which is around about 2%. Okay, so moving on, um, what I'm going to talk about is some of our, our other work where we've been looking at applying organic solar cells onto existing building material. So laminating them onto to, to, to flexible, well not flexible, but three-dimensional um, substrates. So the idea behind this is we use a very low-cost substrate, which is typically costs around about 10, 10 to 15 euros per meter squared. And by using a three-dimensional architecture, what we're able to do is, is capture more light at a low incidence of angle, and we're also able to improve the efficiency of our solar cell by reducing its, its footprint. So we've, we've done um, a number of studies just looking at the, the performance of these solar cells under, under direct irradiation. Um, and what we find is, is one or two configurations in particular work, work well when we, when we laminate them onto these, these three-dimensional substrates. So typically the best performing module we get gives us about a 10% increase in the, the solar cell efficiency. And that's using what we call our, our module B configuration. So that's under direct illumination. 
So what we've then done is, is move towards an indoor solar simulator. And what this system allows us to do is, is vary the, the direction of the light. So we can simulate the um, performance of, of uh, the sun over the course of a day and over the course of a season. So we can, we can vary the pitch, which um, allows us to adjust the seasonal vari variation we get in solar radiation. We can adjust the yaw, which allows us to replicate what happens to the sun over, over the course of a day. So when we take our best performing module, which was module B, what we find is that the, the performance of this solar cell exhibits this really big increase in efficiency under low, low incidence of angle. So whereas a flat module tends to reflect light, which comes in at low, low incidence of angles, by using this three-dimensional configuration, we're able to capture a lot of that light and boost the efficiency. And what we find is that the efficiency increases by almost a, almost a factor 10 at low incidence of angles. So we get quite substantial increases in the solar, solar cell efficiency at, at oblique angles. So what we've tried to do is um, we've done the indoor testing and then we, we moved it up to an outdoor testing system. So in Bangor we have a facility for doing outdoor testing of organic solar cells and we also do various other technologies such as silicon, SIGs um, and disensitized solar cells as well. So what we tend to do is compare the performance of our organic solar cell both on a sunny day and on a, a cloudy day. So two extreme in conditions really. So both of the, this set of data was done in the summer of 2015. Um, compare first of all the, the sunny performance. So the sunny performance in, in, in Bangor means we get up to a radiance of around about a thousand watts per meter squared. So for a flat module we get the, the expected trend where effectively our PCE is relatively flat from around about 8 o'clock in the morning up until about um, 5 p.m. in the evening. But with our three-dimensional module, what we see is a big increase in efficiency in the early morning, so around about 7 a.m. and a big increase around about 7 p.m. So under cloudy conditions, uh, we have a lot of diffuse irradiation, and it's very difficult to pick out any, any specific trends from, from our cloudy data. However, um, what we tend to do is, is aggregate that data over the course of a number of months. So we did around about three or four months of testing and then we looked at the, the average daily daily yield of, of each type of module. And what we find is that the, the three-dimensional module, so the corrugated module, gives a, a bigger energy yield. So on a sunny day what we tend to see is around about a 17% increase in the efficiency and then what we find is as it becomes more and more cloudy then we get a bigger and bigger increase in the, the energy yield. And the other significant point to add is that if we consider sort of peak peak electricity periods, which tend to be 4:30 4, p.m. to 7:30 p.m. in the UK, we get an even bigger increase, bigger relative increase. So our corrugated module gives around about 60% increase in energy yield during those peak peak operating times. So we started to look at the the performance um, over winter as well, and our winter data even improves over our summer data, so we, we get these bigger and bigger relative increases in performance from the, the corrugated module over the flat module. And then finally what we've been looking at is um, larger larger modules, so going towards these, um, I think they're around about 60 centimetre wide modules which we, we, we test and we can compare corrugated through to flat modules. And if we look at the the, the total yield of these modules, what we tend to find is that our, our corrugated modules outperform our, our flat modules by, by quite a significant amount. Okay, so the final thing we've been looking at is evaluating the performance of organic solar cells when, when mounted onto to different parts of a, of a um, building. So that's particularly relevant for, for building integrated PVs because it's generally your, 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 um, your building's a fixed shape. What we really wanted to do was look at the performance of OPVs on, on different sides of the building. Um, so this could, could be an application in itself where you could apply organic solar cells onto different sides of a building, or it could be good for a, a hybrid system where you might have silicon solar cells on the roof and 
organic solar cells around around the, the, the walls of the building. So what we've done is develop a, a setup in Bangor where we can evaluate performance of organic solar cell modules when they're facing a, uh, facing the north, facing the south, facing the east, west, and also modules on the top. And what we're really trying to do is, is calculate the, the, the energy yield from uh, modules directed in, in these different directions. So in terms of the, the module encapsulation, um, what we tend to do is, is we, 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 we get modules from Infinity PV in, in Denmark and then we apply a, a PN uh, barrier layer onto the surface. And one of the important steps we find is to, to use very good edge sealant. So we, we get edge sealant from Dysol and that allows us to um, provide a good, good, good barrier for our solar cells. So when doing the study, it's very important to, to understand the, the, the solar direction. Um, and Bangor, our, our latitude is around about 54 degrees, so we're in the northern hemisphere, um, relatively far north. We, we therefore get a very big um, difference between our, our winter and our summer uh, solar path. So in winter time, we, we get only around about seven hours of daylight. So the sun rises about eight 8 a.m. in the morning and then it sets to around about 4 p.m. In summertime we have a, a really very long day, maybe 17 hours, and it starts from just before 5 a.m. in the morning and then it finishes at 10 p.m. at night time. So considering first of all our, our daily performance um, in winter, um, we first of all we had a very bad winter in, in Bangor so we didn't get many many sunny days whatsoever. But it's very difficult to, to pick out differences in module performance under diffuse conditions. What we tend to find under diffuse conditions, or when it's very cloudy, is that actually the, the differences in the module performance aren't, aren't significant. Um, and actually we, we, we see some indication that maybe the top module gives around about 20 to 30 percent better performance under cloudy conditions. Um, but under these cloudy conditions, this is when the modules show the, the closest closest level of energy yield between them. Um, we, we did get some sunny days and this is a uh, typical data from from the sunny day. When it's particularly sunny in winter time our, our north facing module gets virtually no direct irradiation so it's entirely reliant on reflections, a diffuse, diffuse light striking it. The best performing module we find um, in winter time tends to be our south facing module. Uh, so then followed by our top facing module and then our east and west facing modules. But you can already see the, the, the impact about having different modules has upon the, the energy generation and to some extent we can use an east and west facing module to, to balance out some of the, the electro electricity generation over, over the course of a day. More recently we've been, been having some, some more sunny days in Bangor and it's, it's obviously su summer conditions around about May, May time. So this is an example of data which we, we obtained on the 15th of May when we had very good irradiance levels. Um, and we get some very interesting trends. So first of all, in summertime our, our, our top facing module exhibits the greatest energy yield, which is to be expected. However, when we, when we look at the, the early morning, particularly for north facing module, we get a, we get, we get the best performance actually from the north facing module. And then around about uh, 8 p.m. Our, our north module only really experiences diffuse irradiation. So it does generate power during the course of the day but it's entirely reliant upon reflected light. So it's probably uh, clearer if we look at this picture here. So this compares the east and the west performance. So the sun rises in the east and we get um, a lot of energy generation from that east facing module. And around about 12 o'clock, um, more energy generation tends to come from our, our west-facing module. But they do generate electricity right the way through the day. It's just diffuse irradiation we're relying upon in the, in the early morning for the west-facing module and diffuse irradiation for our east module in the evenings. So our top-facing module, as we, as we expect, gives the, gives the best performance. Um, and our south facing module gives gives quite good performance from around about 10 a.m. through to through to 6 p.m. 
So what we've really been doing is, is looking at the performance on a, on a daily basis over the course of over the course of six months. So we'll be doing ma maximum power point tracking on on every module um, over this sort of six month period. And what we've really been collating is um, monthly yield performances from these different modules. What we tend to find in, in winter months is our south facing module gives the best performances. Um, however, from around about March onwards, our top facing module then gives the best performance. And I suppose the other main conclusion is our, our north facing module, as, as we really expect, shows the, the worst, worst performances. So the other interesting thing we've been looking at is how, how the modules degrade on different sides of the building. Um, we've seen some, some quite interesting trends. So overall our, our south facing module exhibits the, the greatest degradation. Um, we think the reason for that is because it initially experiences the greatest irradiation, um, that sort of triggers a degradation which continues on for, for many months onwards. Recently we've been found in north north facing module actually experiences quite bad stability. Um, and really the reason for that is the north facing module experiences a lot of condensation and the condensation has an impact upon the, the, the stability as well. So it tends to be our north and our south facing modules experience the, 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 the poorest stability. So just some conclusions, um, you know, we've demonstrated that OPVs can be made onto uh, cheap and, and relatively rough steel substrates um, using a, a, a silver nanowire electrode. We've also demonstrated that OPVs can be used into corrugated building products um, and that yields some particular advantages over flat modules. And finally we've shown that module position has a major impact upon the energy yield. So just some acknowledgements firstly to the, the students and, and postdocs in my group, um, also to uh, uh, a collaborator at Cardiff University, uh, Tracy Sweet. Uh, we was also work very closely with Fundacion Itma in Spain and Pascal Sanchez and David Gomez have been very good collaborators. And then finally to the, the group in DTU for a lot of their, 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 their help with modules and measurements. And then finally I'd like to thank some, some of our, our sponsors and financial support and many thanks for, for listening.